Dyson. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm delighted to be speaking on the second reading of the Members of Parliament Remuneration and Services Bill, and I want to acknowledge all the members of the Government Administration Committee um, for the consideration of this bill. Um, we had Chris Ockenvold, Eric Roy, Camelgip, Bakshi, Trevor Mallard, and Materia Toure. The membership changes sometimes on the committee, um, depending on the on the bill. And there was unanimous agreement reached on the bill, and that's um, not unusual for that committee, but it is um, unusual given the complexity of issues in this. And I just want to echo the words of my colleague um, Trevor Mallard that I'm surprised that when we've reached um, unanimity on issues like this and worked actually very hard to get that unanimity, um, and that was because we heard from a lot of submitters who were experts in this area. We heard different views. Um, but, and we talked about it a lot. There was no rushing of this. We wanted to try and get it right in the interests of transparency and workability of these provisions. We got extension of the time for the report back of the bill in order to do that. So I'm surprised that we now have a supplementary order paper presented by Materia Toure, a member of the committee that unanimously agreed to the provisions of this bill, which alters it fundamentally. It's unusual. Um, and, you know, I just want to put on the record my concern about that as a, as a slightly out of usual process um, when, when we're thinking about this bill. Um, a lot of people get very excited when Parliament's debating uh, remuneration for its own members of Parliament, and I understand that. Um, we do earn very high salaries compared to people who work as hard and often for as long hours as we do. So I'm not surprised that members of the public are interested in this. I have heard some media reports this week that during this debate we'd be determining our salary rate, and that's not true. Thank goodness Parliament no longer determines the salary of members of Parliament and ministers. That, that so-called right has long ago gone it's, uh, it's the job of the Remuneration Authority and it should never come back to this Parliament. Um, people in this position of power should have the responsibility of exercising that power carefully and determining your own salary doesn't have a role in that regime as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I'm delighted that the Remuneration Authority has that responsibility. What this bill does um, is actually many things, but one of the critical um, aspects of this bill is who determines the support services and uh, travel allowances, other um, business expenses that members of parliament incur. H whose job is that? Is that the job for the speaker? Is that the job for the minister responsible? Or is it the job of the remuneration authority? So in relation to um, accommodation services, in relation to travel services, not just to members of parliament, but also to our families, um, resolution of issues about those services, and ongoing travel entitlements, as they are known, to former members of parliament. Um, so in that package, um, this bill has transferred those determinations, uh, which are currently with the speaker or the minister, to the remuneration authority. Um, Mr. Mr. Speaker, there was one area which uh, was not contentious within, the, within the, the members on the committee as so much as the members were being offered very good information and advice um, from different submitters, and they conflicted. So we had to say, out of these two, you know, two different views, both of which had a lot of merit, uh, which one would we, which one would we choose? And we chose to amend the bill that had been referred um, to, to us in, in this one regard, and that was in relation to the travel services provided to members of parliament. It is our view that travel services are a fundamental part of a member of parliament being able to operate properly, being able to do their job, and therefore that the determination of those travel services should rest with the Speaker, whose job it is to make sure that every member of Parliament has the resources available to them to do their job properly. It's clearly not a perk. Uh, you know, no, nobody would say that travelling from their home 
to the capital, uh, every, oh, well, I was going to say nobody would say that, that is a per uh, perhaps the Member of Parliament for Wellington Central and whose electorate this um, fine building resides considers that it's a big privilege for members, members from throughout the rest of the country to travel to Wellington. Um, but, but seriously, it is a fundamental part of our job. All of us, whether constituency or list members of parliament, are elected to represent that voice in the parliament. And in order to do that for about 32 weeks of the year, uh, we spend three days a week in the capital. And, and, and of course, uh, for both ministers and members of parliament, there are other responsibilities that we have, as well as coming to parliament, which involve travel. I remember when I was the minister for senior citizens, I made a pledge to Grey Power that should they invite me to any branch of Grey Power throughout the country, I would go to their meeting. Uh, they warmly welcomed that offer. I didn't realise at the time that there were 77 branches of grey power throughout the country. And over my time as Minister for Senior Citizens, I visited over 55 of those 77 branches. I'm making up for uh, the, the remaining 20 um, in my time as opposition spokesperson for senior citizens. But I didn't consider that uh, you know, anything other than a legitimate part of my job. Uh, it was a responsibility that I had taken up in that position, and that's why I do think that it is uh, appropriate for that determination to be part of the legitimate role of a Member of Parliament. But that doesn't extend to family members. So in that regard, the Select Committee agreed that the determination of travel services for family members should properly sit with the remuneration authority. Um, and we have, we've, we've done a few other things in this bill. Um, one of the ones that I think the committee was most, um, most proud of, if that's the right term, was to ensure that it was very clear in the law that um, the support for members of parliament with physical or sensory impairments is properly the responsibility of the House and not of the political party um, that that person happens to be representing. I hope that this sends a very strong and clear message to the uh, disabled members of our communities who may have been put off seeking um, membership of this parliament as an elected member and who were concerned that they might have to bear the responsibility for su support services themselves. Uh, this very same select committee that looked at this bill also has an inquiry into the accessibility of Parliament as a whole. Uh, this message from the committee will help in that consideration because it is a very clear stance in, in terms of members of Parliament, but our inquiry is looking even more broadly than that at what access to information and services from members of Parliament that disabled members of our community can expect. My colleague Trevor Mallard mentioned the fact that it didn't seem to be clear in the law that list members of parliament who came in as a result of another list MP uh, leaving and, and came in part way through the term, it wasn't clear in the law that they were entitled to be paid. Um, we had a bit of a debate about that, but we decided that we would um, ex include that coverage for every list member who, who uh, came in partway through the term, and obviously that has been the practice anyway, so as the Attorney General said, it wasn't an additional incurrence of any expenditure to the Crown. They have been getting paid. Um, there were also some opportunities uh, in the most negative sense of that word for potential double dipping, and we wanted to use this opportunity to make sure um, that double dipping did not occur. Uh, we don't think it has in the past. It was certainly not reported to us as having been the case, and we did ask, um, but we wanted to close down any opportunity for that. In, in relation to members of parliament who might get the um, three months post-retirement payment, but then who come in quite soon after that as a list MP. Uh, so we didn't want that sort of opportunity to be exploited. It's clearly not the intention uh, of this parliament that any member of parliament deserves uh, two bites at a cherry. So, um, Mr Speaker, we've tried to make the rules very clear, very transparent and workable. Um, as I said earlier on, I was, I was really impressed with the effort and energy that all members of the Select Committee 
put on to dealing with some quite complex issues, and I thank them all for that. I call Materia Ture. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I was able to participate on the select committee that considered this bill.